not only the discomfort that propelled me into the military but then finding new discomfort there and then my teacher telling me that I was the one that was messed up not everything that I was seeing that was wrong and that woke me up even further So we have uh, Mr. Frankie Martinez with us. Uh, Mr. Martinez is one of the most uh, widely renowned and most innovative dancers around the world in our time. And I myself, um, being a dancer and as someone who loves dancing and uh, Latin music, I wanted to find out more about his journey so far and also his philosophy uh, on dance and in life as well. So thank you, Mr. Martinez. Uh, for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So uh, just to start, I wanted to know a little bit more about your uh, childhood background. Mm. So <laughs> also from hearing uh, lots of interesting anecdotes yes. in your classes that you share with us. So um, how would you describe you as a kid? What kind of kid you were in? Did you have any idea about what you wanted to become sometime in the future? I, I guess uh, when you say kid, I'm thinking about uh, pre nine years old. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, I had no ideas about what I wanted to become. My, f my focus is, I think, like any child at that time, uh, was on the things that I was interested in, in terms of cartoons and mm -hmm. toys and, and sports to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, at nine years old, I started uh, to study and train traditional karate and even during that time it was um, it was more connected to the things that I've been exposed to in terms of film uh, it was the only exposure that we that we got in, uh, in terms of martial arts and what that meant uh, and because it was part of the cartoons that I was watching and there was always a little uh, combat element and a little martial arts element and a little good guy versus bad guy thing uh, you know it, it it as a young boy I guess it it's uh, part of how we uh, start to explore uh, ourselves as men you know uh, in a competitive way in a in a um, in a um, in a combat way I, th I think that we play uh, and we uh, we have these interests when we're young because we're practicing for what we will eventually need as we get older and so you get young girls playing with dolls and playing family games and My Little Pony and, <laughs> and uh, I was watching He-Man and, <laughs> and uh, the Bionic 6 and, and all those things and, and Looney Tunes and all that stuff, but I guess uh, That was my exposure to martial arts. So so martial arts was a very exciting thing. I already thought I uh, I knew it. Uh, I was my family was kind of involved in it. Both my mother and father studied when they were young. Uh, and my mother actually stopped uh, when she was pregnant with me, and uh, my father continued for two more years after. They studied uh, traditional uh, Wing Chun, mm -hmm. which is the style that Bruce Lee did uh, uh, initially. So I, I it was kind of a rite of passage. I, I always knew I was going to get into martial arts, um, uh, and I had already. Uh, a strong feeling of connection to it because of, of the family and to the things that I was exposed to when I was young. So for how many years did you practice karate? I practiced karate from nine until now. I, I, I do not um, consider that I have stopped practicing karate though. Part of that is is where my philosophy mm -hmm. is embedded. Mm -hmm in that the the I do not practice the physical exercises of karate do and I have not since um, uh, maybe 2000 my physical exercises have been replaced with the physical exercises of dance 
but at the core that's the only change that has occurred in other words I realize that a certain level of development in martial arts that the, f the physical component was a metaphor for other things that were much deeper and those things continue uh, my teacher introduced me to Zen Buddhism when I was 16 years old and he introduced it to me as the underlying force behind everything that we were practicing and studying and that it was necessary for me now at that point and I think that I was uh, I was I had just gotten my third degree black belt mm -hmm. uh, that now I had to start to consider the higher meanings of what it, the higher implications of what it was that we were practicing mm -hmm. And when you start to do that, you start to realize that everything you were doing physically, all those exercises, all the, the specific things that were happening in a tangible way were all pointing to something much larger on a spiritual level. And that that was the important thing. And so that continues and has not been interrupted even for a moment uh, to this day. I have just replaced the the exercise the physical exercises the metaphors have shifted slightly and with a uh, very specific reasoning behind that shift also mm -hmm. and um, you you serve in the Navy yes was was there any particular motivation you had yeah I was I wanted to be a helicopter I'm I wanted to be a helicopter pilot I thought being a helicopter pilot was a good option for me right uh, my father was into aviation uh, and he was a fanatic of anything that was in the air and anytime something flew overhead he would have to stop us and he used to take us to air shows and any movie Top Gun Star Wars anything that had anything flying somebody in a cockpit he was enamored with he had his private pilot's license and there are pictures of us very small four or five years old I think I was in the plane I do remember going up with him once and my parents telling us we were going to visit Santa Claus and he took us up in a flight in a Cessna um, so I uh, my father and mother divorced when I was five years old and so I saw my father on the weekends and here and there we spent time with him and I and I think the aviation thing mm -hmm. uh, he got me interested in that and also uh, it was a way to connect with my with my father in a deeper way and so I saw that as an option because because in reality all I wanted to do was train karate. I, anything else that I was thinking about in my life was to facilitate me being able to continue to train in karate. I remember being in a hospital with my mother uh, for a doctor's appointment and I had a book, a martial arts book that I was reading which I did uh, regularly. I, I ingested uh, source material on anything that had to do with anything to do with the samurai and martial arts and Tai Chi and whatever so uh, I remember her saying it's funny how we only have time and energy for one thing in life and she said I wonder how different you would be if if that uh, fanatical focus would have been on something different like mm -hmm. being a doctor or, mm -hmm. or um, business mm -hmm. um, but so everything else was kind of a side story, it was a side note, everything else was to to put me in a position so that I could continue to train. Mm -hmm. I knew that I'd never make money teaching karate, that's not really, especially if I were to do it tr truthfully. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I knew that I had to make a living but it was for the express reason to keep me training and to give me the possibility to continue to train. The other thing was that my sister, I was going to a uh, community college here in New York uh, and my sister was getting ready to graduate. She's two and a half years younger than me and my sister was, is, is, uh, has been uh, always uh, very, very academically adept and sh she's one of these people that would sit down and watch Jeopardy and in, in a bored way rattle off the answers <laughs> to the questions, you know, and I would be like, well, you need to go on the show. You can make millions of dollars on this show if you were to go on. And she was like, she was that intelligent. Uh, and so she was going to end up being limited in terms of the school that she was going to be able to choose because my mother was raising us alone and we didn't have money for both of us to go 
to school at the same time if she were to go to the schools she wanted to and deserved to go to. And so I found that it was um, it wasn't a just uh, situation, especially because uh, it I was going to school, but it was because I was older and had she had the opportunity first, she might have been able to make that choice, and then I would have had to deal with the side effects of that. So I decided that it would be uh, an easier thing to do to eliminate myself from the equation financially uh, and to be able to help in any way that I could to get my sister into the school that she uh, she wanted to go to so that she wouldn't have to have considerations beyond where she wanted to go. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and like a lot of kids, uh, the military, when you're not sure, and I, and I believe that they, they, they force us really to choose so young and we don't really know what any of this means. My sister ended up going to school, she graduated and she was like, working in things that had nothing to do with what she went to school with and she found out halfway through school she didn't really like what she was doing it's, uh, and I'm sure that's the story for a lot of people um, uh, th those of us that can find a passion early are lucky um, but sometimes that passion is not necessarily a financially viable thing so then you're you're forced to make a decision at a, in an adolescent Mm -hmm. and, and even before you are ready for college, you're, mm -hmm. you're kind of starting to think mm -hmm. about these things at, a, at an age where I think mm -hmm. there are other things going on in your mind and I find that we, we, uh, we're forced to do that too young. Anyway, I, I felt like the military was an easy way to buy me some time to figure things out also, mm -hmm. you know, um, and to have uh, stability in terms of uh, housing and, and finances and medical. And, mm -hmm and to really get my sister through school. So, so that was really what happened. The, the other thing, the other s s kind of side note was that I was an uncomfortable teenager. And I was an uncomfortable teenager, not uh, necessarily for all the normal reasons that teenagers are uncomfortable, but also because I was raised in this very uh, defined, um, disciplined etiquette through karate do, which, which uh, you know, when I mention martial arts, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that have studied martial arts, and a, you know, almost everybody that I speak to says, yeah, I did it for a little while, and there are many martial arts that are that are dancers now. But there is a very big difference between the Japanese martial arts and martial arts outside of Japan, and and. There is a shift in uh, in Japan at a certain time in the martial artists where they start to uh, infuse the word do on the end of the the art form, and so you have aikijutsu, which becomes aikido. Do meaning the way, right? Mm -hmm. And so the jutsu was always the art of mm -hmm. you know, and then the do meant the way, and and there was. That shift, Morihei Ueshiba, the founder of Aikido, um, you know, what the samurai did open hand was, was Aikijutsu. And that started to become uh, the Zen part of what they were doing because the uh, Zen kind of got infused into the culture the same way Christianity gets infused in the Middle Ages in Europe. Uh, Zen becomes infused in the culture at the same exact time in, in China and Japan. And what happens is the language starts to be colored by Zen philosophy, the, all the art forms start to be colored by Zen. The same way our language is very latent with Christian, the, the English language is very latent with Christian mm -hmm. things and our, what we find normal in society are things that have their roots in Christianity. That same thing was happening in uh, Japan with Zen. The tea ceremony is, uh, was a Zen monk that uh, formulated a way of serving tea. And what they're doing is that they, they, are, they are finding the spiritual essence of mastery, of what it means to dominate the physical body, to dominate uh, your ability um, to express the human condition artistically to f reach a point of understanding spiritually. 
And so all those things become meditation in motion, where as the, the Zen f adept would sit on the cushion and be still to do direct meditation, and then slowly start to do what they call kinhin, which is walking meditation, and then they slowly start to incorporate that work into their meditation, where now their work is single-minded and focused, and so they, they, in increments, they, they start to incorporate more and more of their lives in, to, to facilitate a meditative practice mm -hmm. so that they can more and more express and be connected to this present moment. And so the art forms start to become a very practical way of exercising the body to a point that it becomes uh, ceremonial or uh, ritualistic and that ritual facilitates a meditative state and so you have what you would call meditation in motion mm -hmm. which is ultimately what you're looking for you're looking to to whatever it is you're looking to understand from meditation is not for you to understand while you're seated and standing still but while you are going through your everyday life and so in order to make a transition from sitting on the cushion to now moving around, mm -hmm. you have to start to practice how to be single-mindedly focused without cognitive interference on whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and the implications of that, I know we're going to talk about later when we get into that, my philosophy, but the that idea of the 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 Japanese art forms turning into karate, jutsu, ka karate starts to become karate do. Mm -hmm. The root word is uh, is uh, empty hand, you know, and, and it's very much uh, just a combat thing. But the second that you put the do at the end of it, the way of the empty hand, it becomes a way of life. My teachers would always say that the, the goal of karate is the perfection of character. It was never to beat up such and such many people, which if you think about it is, is valueless because, because there's always going to be circumstances and individuals that will be able to beat you. you. There's no way for you to train to beat everyone the same way you see Roger Federer losing tennis matches. And sometimes, and great boxers losing to people they're not supposed to lose to. Th there is no, there is nowhere to go there if you keep following that idea solely by itself, right? That you're going to learn to defend yourself, and then it becomes a combat-oriented thing where you're never going to lose a fight, it, 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 because that's what you're implying. And there are people like. Uh, uh, Musashi Miyamoto, who's, uh, Miyamoto, who's the, the author of the Book of Five Rings, who has uh, accounts of duels, uh, the, the Book of Five Rings, is, uh, he was a samurai, uh, or, or just post-samurai, and he was a, a genius duelist, and he won, I mean, from the time he was a kid, and he was beating people with wooden swords. <laughs> and bamboo rods and they were attacking him with live swords and he beat them all but he talks about in the book trying to find spiritual enlightenment through the mastery of the art of the sword and that as an individual he was still seeking to perfect life itself because just to be good at an art form doesn't guarantee you that it doesn't guarantee you that you're going to be uh, good at life and so that starts to become an underlying uh, theme in the Japanese martial arts whereas as you move into uh, China and Thailand the, uh, Israel their martial arts are martial arts they, they are literally the, f the forms of combat education that have been uh, passed on from warrior cultures throughout time, which is exactly what happened in Japan, 
but at a certain point when war was no longer the focus when people when the, when when factions weren't warring each other the same way in order to preserve the traditions you have to now shift the considerations because you're not worried about defending your farm or your family or your tribe or your clan or your shogun so so there is a, a huge difference in how martial arts affected me uh, in terms of my development as, as a young man. When we were young, uh, the Karate Kid movie came out and I, I started Karate with that wave of people. And that wasn't why I started, but it was that wave of, of, of like consciousness about Karate and this ancient mystical thing and the old man with the white beard and the, having the answers and uh, and I'm gonna bring that movie back up because because there are things in that movie that I think are true to my teaching method as well uh, that is an Eastern way of looking at training something as serious as spirituality through an art form but uh, so martial arts now doesn't necessarily carry and other martial arts didn't necessarily carry those life-changing uh, modes of instruction toward life towards toward uh, the the uh, domination of the self the, the the mastery of the self you were focused on combat effectiveness Bruce Lee was focused on combat effectiveness. Part of Bruce Lee's gripe with tradition was the ritual. And if I can disagree with Bruce Lee, <laughs> which doesn't ever seem to happen, but if I could disagree with Bruce Lee, and Bruce Lee is one of my idols, he was absolutely right. But there was a reason why martial art was concerned with tradition or the martial art that he had seen was concerned with tradition and ritual and why the combat effectiveness as a focus became a secondary concept or a concept that was an on the way concept not the ultimate concept and so Bruce Lee as a young man wanted to fight and win fights and so we see him as a person who was very capable of doing that. Uh, and I think that traditional martial artists l lose that fact as well, that, that the, the, we're, you're not training in an environment of war for the sake of war. You are using the concepts of life and death to teach something more profound spiritually, and that requires a change in character, a change in the way you approach life. Because of this, to bring this back around, I, I found my daily interactions with people outside of the dojo to be very uncomfortable because my friends were, there was no etiquette, there's no respect. Everybody in the dojo is either senpai or kohai, they're either junior or senior. And it means that the, the, it colors the interaction. The interaction is very formal with your seniors, you know. Uh, if you are eating with sensei, sensei sits facing the door. Sensei is supposed to touch his food first before you start to touch your food. If you toast with sensei, your, the rim of your glass is lower than the rim of their glass. You don't move your hands wildly when you speak to sensei. You don't hit sensei when he says something funny or says something silly none of that exists we, we're normal people and you're interacting in a normal way but there is there is a defined uh, manner of comportment that that follows this relationship because this is the person that is going to give you or has the access to things that you want to manifest in your life and so you have to learn to respect that. You have to learn to respect the decision you've made to, to want this. And, and the personification of that is now this individual. And if you have chosen this individual, 
you you don't choose them lightly you, you, you there is a reason ultimately karmically why you are with this individual and and the choosing of a teacher is also very uh, important and and, and uh, special thing so that wasn't present in the rest of my life everything was kind of chaos and and my friends you know girlfriends especially you know they hit you and they smack you and they're, they're playing but these are things that you know I I just found that we were all too casual with each other I think somebody wrote I think it was uh, Funakoshi Gichin who is the founder of Shotokan wrote in a book um, that you should treat uh, honored guests like loved ones and treat loved ones like honored guests and if you think about it we tend to do the opposite we, we treat the people we love in a very familiar way we scream at them we curse at them we tell them all these terrible things that then we have to re regret and take back and apologize for and we talk to them in very informal ways and we degrade the respect we have for each other in the way we relate to each other at the root of that is our projection of responsibility for that person to make you happy in a specific way and so that when they fall short which they inevitably will you then take it out on them and whereas somebody important who you don't have a a familial love relationship with you're very careful with you know if the mayor visits your home you're very careful with that person and but and this person you have no connection to this person but the people we have connection to we you know if you really look at it we talk to them anyway we want to talk to them and and so that was what I was going through I, w I was kind of like in this state of what is wrong with everybody nobody respects anybody else and nobody's respecting me and all the things that I was learning weren't I was finding I was having a hard time uh, transitioning that into my day what I was experiencing in my daily life and I thought that the military we're still on the military I thought that the military would provide this structured pecking mm. order of seniors, mm. juniors, senior says it, you do it, everybody knows who's higher rank, who's lower rank, we facilitate respect for one another to get a single job done, whatever that job is. At the time things were very quiet, it, there wasn't really the feeling of threat of going to war and having to be in combat because I had my own feelings about violence and all that stuff. But. Um, and I wanted to be around the planes. I wasn't able to fly because of my eyesight. And so I ended up doing electronics, aviation electronics, so that I could be around the plane. And, um, and to me, it wasn't a, uh, necessarily a combat direct uh, thing that I had to deal with. Uh, suffice it to say, that was all wrong. I, my ideas about all of that were not what I thought they would be. But those were some of the reasons why I... I went into the military. I, I was feeling a lot of uh, discomfort around me and I, and I, I was uh, starting to blossom in a certain way spiritually and I felt like I was uh, having a lot of um, f uh, difference between what I was un coming to understand in the dojo and what I was experiencing in, in my day-to-day -day life. Yeah, I think that uh, discomfort was was blessing in in hindsight because Absolutely. it was helping you to figure yourself out yes. and the world figure the world out and the relationship as well. Yes, and I and I think that you know whether it's martial arts or just regular life, I think that those are the things that really propel us to make those discoveries and those changes are are, are not um, the the funny thing is that my teachers dealing with me my first teachers dealing with me because at the time that I entered the Navy I was studying with my second teacher who was my first teacher's teacher this is in karate do and I still had contact with my first teacher and I would write letters and you know I told my first teacher no one here has any character you know once I was in the Navy I was like Every, everybody's just as much a mess here it's just an excuse to, you know there's a bunch of drunk people that and, you know they just want an excuse you know they have a badge so they can tell you what to do and take out all their problems. They're not really people that have really worked on themselves, which is what you saw in karate. The, the people that were in positions of 
in senior positions were people that had worked on themselves and they had something to offer you in terms of putting you through what they went through to understand that uh, and that wasn't what I saw in the military uh, but but my teacher uh, you know th there is a moment and it happens in dance where people get to a certain stage that I call the knucklehead stage the knucklehead stage is is the yeah but stage right it's when you start to become comfortable with the the implications of the thing and you start to become mathematically uh, proficient at what it is that is being disseminated and you start to think you get it now right you start to think you understand and that's what I was going through at that time I, I thought I was getting something so profound and when I looked around me and I saw what the average person was doing I felt so uh, sad for them you know I felt so sad for watching masses of people going into the subways every morning masses of people coming out every evening you know it was like this cattle run you know where everybody was kind of in this mindless uh, you know that, that life had told them this is what you're supposed to do and they just are following it mindlessly and I was starting to become aware of so much more and so you know so much more depth that was available to us that we just weren't interested in we were just so interested in being part of this rat race but my my teacher uh, as I do now didn't cater to that which is what I thought I thought he was gonna be proud of me because he had opened my eyes to something more profound and now I was better than the average person and so he had to slow me down and, and get me to realize that I am exactly the same as the average person and that I am just because I have a, a new perspective doesn't mean I understand the thing yet and that there is no difference between me and those people in a in a universal sense in a in a absolute sense and that I had to learn to appreciate life for what life was not what I thought life was supposed to be uh, and th that is I think difficult for us all of us you know to to deal with what we have in our heads about things and uh, you know to to living a life according to that fantasy that we put in our heads about what we're observing and how we are analyzing what we're observing in life you know uh, and 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 that was also very much a change in mm. in me not only the discomfort that propelled me into the military but then finding new discomfort there and then my teacher telling me that I was the one that was messed up not everything that I was seeing that was wrong and that woke me up even further uh, and, I, and I those things have affected me very profoundly in the way that I that I teach so whether it uh, whether it's being karate or dancing or any other physical uh, form of practice. I think, I guess what mattered to you was to get to somewhere, um, some form of training so that you can grow continuously. Am I describing more or less correctly? To, to a degree, yes. I, I think it is uh, what I came to understand uh, and a lot, of, a lot of influences in my life put me on this track but I came to understand this concept of 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 finding the master, you know, mm -hmm. of finding the teacher. That is an old Indian concept, you know, of of going, leaving home, finding the guru, a person. Yes. Okay. A and and having that person uh, teach you to go through their teachings mm -hmm. to find your freedom and to find your connection to this life and, and how uh, how to best uh, express its potential. That was uh, evident in all the movies that I was 
attracted to, whether it was Star Wars or the Karate Kid, or you know, there was always the old man, the old kung fu movies. You know, that you find the old man on the mountain, and he's the one that teaches you. You know, it. it um, we the, the profoundity of what you end up looking for requires generations and generations and generations, if not uh, centuries and centuries of of development to now up appear to you in the form of this person who is part of that lineage to now pass on what these people have have worked out. And I was never r religious, you know, I, I was never, um, I was never, I wasn't brought up religious, it was kind of a w weird hokey thing that I, that I felt was like this weird witch doctory thing going on in churches and the, it was very strange to us, you know. And so organized religion, to this day organized religion is still very strange to me. Um, but the things that the people at the heads of those religions were trying to talk about mm -hmm. are very interesting to me. But then it gets lost the second we get past those people and they start to, uh, you know, organize things into, uh, you know, these religious factions that are now you know, that turn uh, into conquering... Uh, forces that are now, uh, you know, uh, warring factions and things like that. All of that m makes no sense to the source material. Uh, but that, those things that these people were, and, and the funny thing is that in the 70s and 60s, there, were, there was this thing with these cults, right? And these people were popping up and people were kind of getting back to this idea of go find this teacher and the teacher, and the teachers were all saying things that were very... Uh, powerful they they were echoing things from buddhism and, and hinduism and and you know judaism in terms of society being not what life is about and that society we've created this mess but that you know it's 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 brainwashing in a certain sense and so we have to de-brainwash and but then they were re-brainwashing into whatever the hell was going on with those cults at the time. Um, but these were these. There is a I think a, an innate human need to answer these questions uh, about what we're doing here and what happens after we die and where do we come from. And that uh, knowledge nowadays seems to be something that people can figure out on the internet and they can you know take uh, from nine twenty nine different teachers and everywhere they can get it information 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 and I've never been a proponent of that I've, I've I come from the school of you find a teacher you're careful about selecting that teacher mm -hmm. if you that teacher takes you to a certain point and you realize that another teacher is going to be necessary then you make that choice very uh, seriously but that you and part of it is because for me mastery is mastery there is no mastery of the tea ceremony being different from the master of archery for me they are different languages that are bringing you to the same realization and that realization is universal that's another thing my teacher my first teacher had to kind of smack me around with in my in my knucklehead face whether you are studying karate or you're studying uh, ninjutsu -do or you're studying uh, judo or kendo the implications are the same at the end of the day. The master of Kendo understands the same thing as the, the true master of Kendo. Not an expert, a physical expert, but a, someone who has mastered the thing. Someone who is not apart from the thing anymore. They do not see a person and an art form anymore. There, there, there is no longer that distinction. 
that person comes to understand the same thing as the master of horse riding or, or you know the, 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 the problem is that mastery is very rare mm -hmm. and we we misinterpret expertise with mastery and so there are very few masters and there are uh, very few people who can let us know that in order to arrive at that point you have to go through these levels of transcendence you know you have to go through understanding it at this level and now understanding it at this level and now understanding it at this level and the same truth keeps having different iterations as you get deeper and deeper into it and that requires time for an individual to put you through that you know as opposed to you fumbling around with life and hearing conflicting information from different teachers which you perceive as conflicting information because you still don't understand you know you still don't understand that they're saying the same thing and that both things are simultaneously true they don't uh, impose on each other just because they seem to be theoretically opposed to each other and that's our way of thinking our way of thinking is from this line you know and our ability to understand that multiple things are true at the same time is very difficult for us this is the way we, we we look at history we look at history in a line you know and when you start to really find out what's going on in a period you realize there's hundreds of factors that play into the first thing you say about a historical event you know and and you cannot understand history if you don't understand all those factors but who wants to take you know dozens of years truly digging into that stuff you know but that's where the reality is it's it's when all those things are true simultaneously it's quantum physics right is something is in this position and in this position at the same time in multiple positions at the same time our brain doesn't work that way you know because our brain works for this macro world and we filter information a certain way and so we have to logic to us means this then this then this then this and that's not really how things work it's hard for us to accept that you know but but uh, that is why for me it is important to find a teacher and to in Zen they say you enter the teachers gate meaning that you start to study with them you start to get the surface stuff but that you follow the teacher into the temple, into the house, into the home and get a full understanding at the highest levels of what it is that they're trying to impart. And that takes years, you know, and until you arrive there, you don't understand the universalness of all other modes of thought or all other, what all other teachers may promise you because you go into the gate of this teacher and then you go into the gate of this teacher and you go into the gate of this teacher and you're getting the same level of information in different iterations you're never getting into the house and never getting into the temple you're never getting to the second and third layers of what these things start to mean as you start to transcend their normal logic human logical implications